a property manager who got charged with manslaughter. I had a property where I got fire code violations and had to go. I used to have a huge butt. <laughs> oh, like I played soccer. It was huge. I would get teased in school for having a big butt, yeah. you know, and I, I was proud of that butt. You made $100,000 off of like putting something on paper and then somebody else selling it. Yeah, killing trees. What, killing trees. <laughs> and uh, she had cancer. She had one of her legs cut off. Oh, and it was, and I love her in the sense that she would not. You want to avoid litigation. It is the, the it kills businesses, it kills families, it kills marriages, yeah. it kills. You have to be really careful about who yeah. you take money from. Yeah. Um, because if you take money from the wrong person to invest. Yeah. So I have a incredible, you're going to love this guest. Okay. Her name is Julie Broad. She makes dreams come true for thousands and thousands of people. I followed her before for quite a while. I secretly stocked her channel on YouTube because I published a book and I got my voice out there and I poured my heart and soul into this book. So she's actually really good at helping people discover their voice, being able to get what's in here and in here on to actually something and then making money off of it, actually making money off of your own concepts that go into your head and being able to distribute that and sell it. So I'm so excited to pick her brain for you so that you can make money by making maybe one of your dreams come true, which could be publishing a book. It could be getting that thing out there that you've always wanted to get out there and actually monetizing it. She is like obsessed with helping people accomplish their dreams in this realm. And she's been obsessed and consistent for, I think, well over a decade, maybe longer. But I don't know anybody who's more passionate about making the book dream come true than Julie Broad. And you don't have to like, like, anyway, and that's not an insult, is it? I mean, like, <laughs> we're calling you Broad. I, gr I grew no. up like the Broad was a bad thing, you know? No, it's, I mean, call me Broad all you want. <laughs> I don't want to upset anybody. <laughs> hey, thank God nobody uses that in culture anymore, right? Not, I, I not that I know of, no. And if you, if I ever hear it, I just think they're talking about me, so it's fine. <laughs> uh, that's that's true. To be talked about is better than not, right? Absolutely. I always tell people that when they get a one star review, I'm like, well, at least somebody's paying attention to you. You pr you probably said something that upset somebody or they don't like your title, but they didn't read your book if they gave you a one star review. But they're talking about you. <laughs> yeah, for sure. How did you how did you end up like? What gave you the idea to help people write, write books and, and to actually facilitate them? I know how painful it is. It was fi it, like 26 years of research, five years of writing, three editors that I'm yeah. sure when we were done with the book wanted to commit suicide <laughs> because it was so, the, it was like giving birth. <laughs> I, I, I mean, and, yeah, yeah. and you're able to help so many people. Like how, how did... Did you get started doing this? Yeah, so I was I was a real estate investor in Canada, um, and I was I'd built a platform. So I had a newsletter, YouTube channel, all those things. And the publisher approached me, mm -hmm. and I was like, "Oh, cool! I get, I'm going to get to write a book, and I'm going to get a book deal." And I said, and they said, "Oh, do you have a book? You know, we're interested in working with you. Do you have an idea?" And I was like, "Yes, I do." And they said, "No, no, that that's too general. We don't want that one." They said, "But here's an idea." So they gave me an idea, and they said you know, go write a proposal for this. So I worked with their acquisitions editor and I hired people on the proposal, submitted the proposal and was waiting. And I got an email and it said, the marketing department doesn't think you'll sell enough books for us to give you a book deal. You know, thank you. So Wow. Yeah, but it, I can laugh and smile about it because it was the greatest thing. Because what it did was, I, so first of all, they rejected me. It, te it teased you with a dream. They, they, they opened up the idea of you could be an author. Mm -hmm. And I was like, and I really wanted it. But then they rejected me, which fueled me. Right. And so I went down the path of learning everything I could about publishing a book, which in 2011, there wasn't that much about self-publishing, but that's where I went. And I ended up writing my original book idea that they said, you know, we don't want that. It's too general. But I went back to that, wrote that, and I self-published it. And I took it to number one in print books. So wow. I outsold Dan Brown. I outsold Game of Thrones. I was in the top 100 print books for almost 200 days. Still to this day, that book outsells some of my more current books. It's just, wow. it just so you've been a number one bestseller. I have out of the gate mm -hmm. with a book they said would fail. Yep. So yep. the marketing department was wrong. They were very wrong, and then they called me a few years oh, wow. later, and they're like, "Are you thinking of doing another book?" And I was like, "Yes, oh, yeah, yes, but I not am. with you." <laughs> I mean, I made way more money. That's the thing a lot of people don't realize is, had I gotten that book deal with those sales from that first year, I would have made less than ten thousand dollars in royalties from from the publisher. Yeah, people but, don't realize that. No, and I was almost at a hundred thousand 
in royal it, like in my own proceeds it's not royalties from wow. the books i sold 100 so, grand yeah in that first year you made a hundred thousand dollars off of like putting something on paper and then somebody else selling it yeah killing trees <laughs> what killing trees wow yeah wow a hundred thousand dollars on your first out of the gate yeah book but it kind of what led. was it on it was what is it? it was called more than cash flow it was a real estate investing more book. than cash flow mm -hmm. wow. i talked about my what, why they didn't think it was an interesting book was because it was a general real estate investing book. But, you know, I had read 65 different real estate books at that time, mm -hmm. and everybody talked about how to get rich. Nobody yeah. talked about the things that I'd experienced, which was a property manager who got charged with manslaughter. I had a property where I got fire code violations and had to go to court. I had, I had tenants pulling knives on each other. That wasn't in any of those books. Yeah, for example, I have a 24,000 square foot building, it flooded. Uh, the the uh, insurance company came out. They cut four feet of every square inch where the each neighbor could look straight down the whole building. Right, every I had it was full of yeah. tenants, completely full of tenants. And um, about a month later, they moved it to an adjuster, another adjuster. A month later, and then all of a sudden, he he spoke so eloquently, and he was so sophisticated. He sophisticatedly told me that the entire claim, millions of dollars, they would not pay, and they didn't pay it. They gave me, they said, you're only uh, going to get $10,000 wow. off of this, this piece. And um, yeah. I've been suing them for seven years. We go to um, trial April 29th. Oh my gosh. It's been seven years, three law firms later. I have the best law firm ever. Yeah. We're doing test juries. We're doing all kinds of stuff. Oh, my gosh. And literally, I mean, we, are, we have an appellate attorney that's coming to make sure they can't appeal it. Yeah. I mean, we are going to war, <laughs> major <laughs> war. Did I mention the person name of the company? No, no. Okay, good. I don't want to mention. But we are like literally, like I, we have all guns a blazing yeah. on this one. And um, you, part of the reason is, no one would have lasted who could last seven years seven years yeah three law firms later wow plus i had to fix the building on top of that Jeez. like who does it and that's why i have not agreed to settle with them yeah i'm like i'm nobody is gonna have to go through what i go through yeah um and the judge even gave us the ability to get punitive damages good so like that's not in a book no nope. If, if, if I wrote what I've experienced in real estate, like I've built a couple hundred homes, yeah. this house I built, the house next door I built, the one across the street I built, yeah. tore down whole neighborhoods. Like, yeah, so if you put that in a book, because I, I was always afraid nobody would actually do it with <laughs> Like, who would do this stuff? Well, and I mean, that's why nobody had done it, right? Because everybody's yeah. selling a course or their yeah. you know, program on the back end. Look which how I beautiful did. this is. Right. <laughs> Like, look, oh, you too can own a crack house. Like, you know? <laughs> it was great. Um, but I mean, that was kind of in my heart of hearts. I was like, somebody needs to know that if they're going through this, they're not yeah. alone. Yeah. And they also need to know that, hey, if you do some of these really great strategies that make the course, the person selling the course rich, yeah. you might end up with some of these problem properties. But, you know, and that was the other thing I talked about a lot was, you know, real estate's a problem, but you can choose the kind of problems you're going to have. Right. And, uh, and so... So yeah, I put it in a book and I kind of thought I had investors at the time because we'd raised a lot of capital and I thought they're, they're going to think that they've made the worst mistake in their lives investing with me. But the opposite happened. People called me up out of the blue and they're like, I this got $250,000. Yeah. Yeah. They're like, I got $250,000. Can I invest with you? You know, and it felt like the first time it happened, I thought it was like one of those bad cruise, call, you know, those calls where like, you've won a cruise. Like <laughs> That's how it felt. But no, wow. he, he read my book and he said, you know what? You've been through the ringer. I'd rather invest with somebody who knows after going through what you've been through, then wow. invest with somebody who hasn't. Wow. So it raised a ton of money for us because the book was out and it was honest. Wow. You know, it's, it's fascinating because I have this debate with, with Anna a lot. Um, not so much anymore because I've already got it out there that I've been a multimillionaire four times, but I've gone and been homeless once so bad yeah. that I just totally cratered and was uh, 875000 in debt that time, $12.8 12 million dollars the the next time and uh, was down and she she never wanted me to tell anybody that I ever failed. She wanted me to only talk about my successes mm -hmm. and only show my successes and all that. And I'm like, that's just not I, I, I want to tell the pain, too. Mm -hmm. So you put the pain down, you put the book down. And from that, you used a book to also raise money. 
I didn't intend it to raise money because honestly, I didn't think anybody would want to invest with me after they knew about all the things that I'd done wrong. Wow. But yeah, it ended up raising a ton of money for us. Wow. And, uh, and, and it also grew my coaching business dramatically because I had a mastermind group and, you know, I coached investors on how to buy property. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it, it, that company doubled in size in the year after. And I think what you just said, though, I think is really important for books because a lot of people do want to make, you know, they want to tell the good stuff. Yeah. The good stuff's boring. It is. The, the, yeah, it, it is boring. And it boring. doesn't make a good book. So if you tell that gritty stuff, yeah. it gives people inspiration that the crap they're going through because everybody's going through crap. Yeah. Is going to be something they can get through and maybe they can get to the other side and have something cool happen. Yeah, it's 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 fascinating that, you know, and I think especially in the world, this Instagram world and everything that we're, we're in, yeah. um, people are putting just their good side out. Yeah, like, so much. I, I don't do any filters on my pictures. I don't like I wear the exact same clothes every single time. I'm like the po I yeah. just don't want it. I don't want to do that. I'm not going to put on the suits. Yep. Uh, I'm not going to try and impress people. Absolutely. I, I just want to help people. And, and I think it's, it's real different in that regard. I, I, so when people called you to invest money with you after mm -hmm. reading your book, right? Like how, how did you handle that, that call? How did, like, what did, like, no, I'm not taking money. I never even thought about it. I just wrote a book and now you want to <laughs> give me money. Um, uh, like, no, I'm not set up to take your money. Yeah. One of the things, cause I'm a huge, there's four, th four, four rules I have for, for business, yeah. right? One is don't lose money. I got that from Warren Buffett. Mm -hmm. Rule number two, I got from Warren Buffett too, which is rule number one. Yep. Right. The third rule is never lose control of your money. Mm -hmm. And the third, the fourth, which is what I want to talk about is, uh, the litigation, Yep. You want to avoid litigation. It is the the it kills businesses, it kills families, it kills marriages, yep. it kills I, it kills more than anything I'm seeing in business today. Yeah. Is litigation. I don't see like the government isn't as big a threat. You can work with them. Attorneys you can't. Yeah. Right? And you get and we live in a victim culture mm -hmm. that incentivizes people to be victims. Yeah. You know, which is crazy. So you get a phone call to take money. Yep. If they're not a qualified investor, it, was this in Canada? It was in Canada. Oh, so the okay. rules are different. Really? Yeah, the rules are different than than here. But also... How, did the, you take their money? I, we did, actually. We did multiple deals it. with that person. But they happened to be local. Okay. So it was great because we were able to meet with the person and we knew their business. You know, there was, there was actually connections, which then set us up so that we could raise more capital because we went through it with him and kind of understood. We'd already raised some money previously for some of the deals we'd done. So... Wow. It wasn't brand new to us, but the experience of raising money from somebody you'd never met before was different. Yeah. And I think, I think it, it, you have to be really careful about who yeah. you take money from. Yeah. Um, because if you take money from the wrong person to invest, yeah. they can be your worst nightmare. Yes, absolutely. We actually gave one property back to the investor um, because he was he was 90% of our nightmares <laughs> yeah. was him. He was, he nitpicked everything. He was like, he would walk the property daily and it was a residential house. It wasn't like a big commercial right. place. So we actually ended up giving him the property back because yeah. he wouldn't buy it from us. He wouldn't let us out of the partnership. So we were just like, here, just you take can it. Have it. You can have it. Yeah. <laughs> I think when you, when you look at your time, you could write another book. Yeah, <laughs> with, with, I could. Yeah. <laughs> oh God. Yeah. Ninety ways to deal with a difficult investor. Yeah. That, God, how long did how long did you stay tortured? Um, good question. It felt like forever, but I don't think it was a year. I think after a year, we kind of said this is this is not working. Yeah. And so we tried. We we had lawyers. We tried to get out of it. We tried to say you know just take our costs. Like we weren't even trying to get a profit out of it. Mm -hmm. Like we were like just pay us the money we'd put in, which we hadn't put in much because our investors mostly funded the deals. But I think we'd put in like 18,000 on renovations and, and we were like, just pay us the 18,000 and it, no. And he kept being a nightmare, kept being a nightmare. So finally we were like here. And he even took it to a lawyer because he didn't believe that we would be giving the, he thought there had to be a catch somewhere yeah, yeah. in it. But there wasn't. We just wanted him out of our lives. <laughs> wow. So that is a reflection of who he is. Yeah. Absolutely. That's an Absolutely. absolute reflect. There, are, I've had partners I've given businesses to fifty percent of it, and end up embezzling like eight hundred thousand, forging stuff, and then trying to extort me for a million. 
And uh, you go to court, the, the, here's the tough thing about court. 50% of the time they get it wrong. Oh gosh, yeah. You know, and I, it, it hit me about, I think it was maybe four months ago. Here, here I've been in, you know, so much stuff over the years because stuff happens. Um, but it finally hit me because every Supreme Court decision, do you ever hear seven judges say yes? There's usually four and three, yep. right? And different four and three, yeah. not even the same four and three. So you know it's somewhat political, but not necessarily. Yeah. That means 50% of, if they had three and three, they would, one, never make a decision. Yep. And two, they'd always be 50% wrong. So when, whenever you go to court, yeah. there's a good chance that they'll, the judge will get it wrong 50% of the time. And I told my attorney that. He goes, you finally get it, Andrew. You finally get it. I've lost cases I should have won, yep. and I've won cases I should have lost yep. in front of the same judges. And that's the danger of going to court. Of going to court mm -hmm. is on. It's it's like any given Sunday, like soccer. I mean, uh, football. <laughs> you know, if you have equal talent, yeah, anything can happen. Um, and you never know the like how something is going to look until it's verbalized. And mm -hmm. then you're like, that isn't even the, that isn't even the truth. Yeah. But it's amazing. People lie in court. It's like, I think people lie more in court than they do in life. <laughs> right. It's yeah. Unbelievable. So you get this money, you get, you had this one crazy investor and you, you write the book. How do you get like, how do you get back to focusing on books and then helping other people? Like, how do you get back? How is your journey back after you've written this this real estate book yeah. that turns into like people throwing money at you yeah um and you're successful in real estate mm -hmm. how do you get back to the book journey yeah i mean books are where my heart are my heart is i should say yeah um so it, I, in that mastermind group that i was coaching people i started coaching people who were writing books and they were paying certain companies to do you know these books, which I thought were quite terrible. Mm -hmm. um, and then they were wondering why they weren't selling. And so they were, you know, a lot of my real estate coaching started shifting to the book stuff. And I liked that way more than mm -hmm. coaching people on all the same tenant problems and all the other stuff. So I started to kind of think, well, what if I could do something? And that's actually when I started the YouTube channel just to answer people's book questions because everybody was asking me, how did you do this? Your channel is amazing. Oh, thank I you. Mean, you're, yeah, <laughs> it's fun. I, I still it, yeah, I, I'll do it for a long time because I like it. So mm -hmm. they started asking me and I started, I started kind of building the channel and just answering their questions there. Mm -hmm. And then I think it was 20, 2016, my husband started to start to do deals that I was like, why are you trying to do that deal? And, and he was bored, you know, cause we were just doing the same thing over and over and over again. Like, I was, I was like, go find a hobby. Like, you know, yeah, we yeah. don't need to do dumb deals. Like yeah, just go find yeah. a hobby. So he started acting and he started to, he got a coach and he started to do auditions and he started to, you know, do shoots, but I'm not a patient person. And so yeah. I was like, so if you're going to go all in on this, like let's, let's go all in on it. Right. right. And and, and so we started looking, I was like, well, we kind of have to go to LA if you're going to go all in. Mm -hmm. And so we, I was already starting to wind down the mastermind group that I was running. I licensed off the courses I'd built and I, I sold the website and the YouTube channel. And, uh, and so I started to think about what would a company look like that I would have liked to hire? And so I just started to build book launchers with the idea of a, a lot of that stuff is a pain as you experience. Oh my God. It is confusing. And yeah. you, what do you do? What's the choice here? What's there? And distribution. D distribution. I mean, we can get great distribution, but there's like four companies you got to set up accounts with. And yeah. it's, it's a lot. And I didn't enjoy that part. So I thought, well, I'm probably not the only one. It can be time consuming. It's plus hugely you got time upload. consuming. Yeah. It's if I hadn't been fueled by the rejection, I would never would have got the book to where I got it to because that just ignited the, oh, you told me I can't, <laughs> right, right. you know, that kind of spirit. Um, but so yeah, I built, I just started dreaming up a company because I'd, I'd flowed down to LA and I'd looked at buying a business, but every business kind of like real estate has a problem. And mm -hmm. I thought, well, if I'm going to have problems, I'll create my own. Like, yeah. so instead yeah. of buying a business, I started book launchers and that's kind of how I got into this spot. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So do you still have that real estate or you sold it? Yeah, off? we have, we have some. 
Oh, speaking of problems, we had a 30,000 square foot office building mm -hmm. go 80% vacant January 2020. Wow. So, yeah, we experienced a lot of pain, drama, yeah. drama and pain with that one. So we had to sell some property to fund that. And we ended up finally selling that property. But, you know, a vacant office building, at, you know, at, during that time. Oh, yeah. There was nobody. Nobody, nobody was, was looking. No, no. no. It was... Um, that people were downsizing or out, out altogether. Yeah. Um, and renegotiating deals. And yeah, it was, it was, uh, that was a very, n nobody knew where, nobody knew where, what, what, where life was going. No, nobody was going to sign a lease. There was nobody all year. We never had a single in February. We actually had somebody look, um, like a tech company was looking at the building. Um, but for the rest of the year, nobody even looked at the property. So, wow. so yeah, we still have some property, but we, we, that one was a good, a good bleeder. <laughs> wow. Speaking of all that happened, now everybody's going to be like, I don't want to invest in real estate after this, but you know, have you, have you seen what happened with the real estate litigation here in the United States? No. So they, um, they won a judgment, um, or they settled for like, I think it was 450 million or $418 million, okay. um, for the commissions where you because a seller pays both the commission for the seller yeah. and also for the buyer, mm -hmm. right? Which I've always, I started a magazine called uh, Property Sold by Owner yeah. because I, at 18, I wrote a business plan that I just didn't agree with yeah. that. I think it's crazy. Let me pay for my adversary because it's an adversarial relationship. Yeah. For a buyer's agent, I'm going to pay them to fight with my seller's mm -hmm. agent and then I'm going to pay all that because I own the property. Yeah. And the buyer gets the benefit of representation. He gets the benefit, like it, or she gets the benefit of everything, yeah. of like walking through the transaction, doing everything. And if it's somebody related to them, they're paying somebody that's, a, yeah. or if they're doing their own deals, they're paying themselves. Yeah. I, I, I was like, this is just crazy. Well, after 30 years of fighting, it finally hit him square in the head. Oh, okay. That this is yeah. really not a good thing. So now they can't, the MLS, <laughs> national MLS, yeah. is not allowed to tell buyers, agents, that there's a co-op that they're going to get for showing a property. Mm. So now that that is gone. It's disturbed the whole market. And there's another like $1.8 billion judgment that's coming down that was hit. Yeah. And uh, I see probably what could be um, copycat lawsuits that could spring up across the entire country. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, that's interesting. Yeah, it's it's pretty crazy. Um, and then I hear all the agents talk about how, oh, you just got to have a buyer's again. It's like, wow, you, you guys have no, you, you haven't dealt with attorney. Most of them have not dealt with the legal system or attorneys or what it's like yeah. when you completely have to change something. <laughs> but yeah, I didn't, I was wondering if you knew about that because it's been such a hot topic. Very, I mean, it, it should be trending more than it is, but it's out there. Yeah, there it's was a, pretty, there was a state, now that you've talked, explained it, there was a conversation I had with somebody about it, but I didn't really understand what it was. So now I do. Yeah. Yeah. So how do you like, you know, it, it's interesting that how does, like, what's the process for somebody to, like, they have an idea that they want to write a book about. Mm -hmm. um, like, I, I did my book, The Origin of Opportunity, but then I have another book that I've, I've mostly written called Unreasonable, mm -hmm. right? Um, and then I have another book that's mostly done called Financially Disturbed, yeah. which talks about our, our financial system. Yeah. And then I have another one that I started called Reluctant Billionaire. Okay. You know, but it's like, getting getting them to completion mm -hmm. right so a lot of people probably have start those but don't complete them yep so how how do you get people from concept to completion yep like that's a that's a that's a whole podcast in itself i guess yes. so how do they how do, what's step one i mean so for step one for us is understanding why they want to write the book like what's success look like because a lot of people say oh i want to be a bestseller but you have to unpack what that actually means because bestseller is like a one hit like woohoo you can be a bestseller and then what um so usually they want to do keynote talks or they want to grow their business or their brand you know there's usually some other because we only do nonfiction, mm -hmm. so there's usually some other reason and then we look at the book and we go okay is this going to get you there because some people 
the book is not going to actually get them where they want to go. They've been told, oh, you've got a great story. You should write a book. Probably from people who did, were tired of them talking about yeah, their yeah. story. But, <laughs> I you never know. thought about that. Yeah. Like, <laughs> no. don't tell me. Just write it down yeah. and give it to the world. And so that's, you know, a lot of people have a story that they've written and they think it's going to make them a keynote speaker. Mm. And I had one woman who'd written her story of estrangement from her family uh, and she thought it was going to get her onto Fortune 500 stages. And I was like... No, they don't really care about your estrangement story. Like, I don't know how that's going to help them with their, you know, 10,000 employees. So right. a lot of it's kind of figuring that piece out. But once we know that, and if the book is, has good bones or at least a good spine as far as what it's going to deliver. What's, then, a, what's a spine? So like a hook. It's, okay, so hook. the through line. So if you're in Hollywood, it would be the, you know, the, the story you're telling, but in nonfiction, it's the outcome of the outcome. So yeah. a lot of people are sharing their story because it's going to give other people hope. Well, unless you're famous, you know, unless you've got that celebrity status, your story isn't going to be the one they choose if they want hope. So your hope has to be applicable to that type of reader. So hope for that they actually can run the business they always wanted to and have it be profitable or hope that that they, you know, they're at rock bottom today, but there is a path forward for them to have the relationship they always wanted or something like that. So it's got to be a little bit more specific. So that's why I always call it the outcome of the outcome. So if they've got that and you can see how it's going to lead to the bigger picture, then there's, you know, 10 different ways we can finish the book. We can finish the book by having a ghostwriter interview you. We can have them, uh, we can have you get coached through finishing it. We can use AI now can help us kind of help fill out the bones if you've got content. And so many people have content now. So, you know, even with my last book, I got three quarters of the way through and I was dealing with so much stuff that I was five months late delivering this book to my team, which is not a good feeling. And one of my team members said, you know, we have writers. And I was like, oh, yes, I, I do know. And they're like, why don't you use one? I'm like, never used a writer on my book before. The book was done in a month. And, oh, wow. and she only had to talk to me once. And she talked to one person on my team once because I have so much video content. She was able to take the outline, pull the content from the videos and write it. And I can't tell you where she picked up, where she picked up, where I left off. I can't tell you. Really? I do not know. Because she captured three quarters of the book was written. So it was easy for her to capture my voice. So that was done. And then my team just carried it through as far as all the editing, you know, the design, all those pieces. So it was a much lighter lift for me than any book I've done before, because I finally just said, I can't finish. You guys finish. So that's kind of what we do for our clients. The difference is we don't know. They, my team won't know them like they knew me. So they'd have to spend some time getting to know the client so they can help them through the finish line. But there's a lot of ways, especially if you've got something to work with from the beginning. Some people will just talk it out record a voice note. So you get some content out there. But if you've already got podcasts, you've got videos, it's pretty easy to finish the book. But wow. making it great, that takes extra effort. Yeah, that, that's true. My my book, most of it, um, I recorded um, yeah. verbally. And I found that that was my process. Mm -hmm. I, I tried to force myself to write. Yeah. And that was just... Every time I'd have a thought, it wouldn't. It by the time I'd get it out, it'd be I'd be debating over the words mm -hmm. or debating over how it came out, you know, writing wise, and it was just horrific. Mm -hmm. So what I did was recorded it, and then I took it to I got it uh, transcribed out of the Philippines at the time, yeah, um, and ha had people transcribe it, and then I popped it into chapters, and then started organizing everything and laying it out, and then I had like. An editor that was like the one that made sure there was a through line and that, right. that there was like <clears throat> things that were happening throughout the book that yep. that progressively you got to a finish line. Yep. Um, which the finish line in my book is nothing. You get to a place of nothing. So that's the goal. <laughs> is that you, it's you, nothing. <laughs> you realize that all the stuff you've been telling yourself <laughs> is a bunch of like BS, you yeah. know, belief system, and you're just you get to the point where you can honestly sort of divorce yourself of that. Right. You can use it, but you don't have to. Yeah. You know, and it, it's a space I've been able to create the 32 companies in 17 industries because I don't come in. I come in from a place of nothing. Yeah. From an emptiness, you know, hmm. and that's that's really the the foundation of the book. But, uh, you know, and I never wanted to be a bestseller. Yeah. I just wanted to get all these thoughts out and down on paper so I could just get them down and it felt so refreshing yeah to it was almost very cathartic um and i think there it sounds like there's really two different real processes one like me very cathartic 
yeah. and to, close to the heart. And the other is I just want a book. Yeah. Right? Like your first book was, sounds like, was your heart. Yeah. The second book was, I got all this information. Let's Share just, the information. Let's just mm -hmm. package it and get it out there. Yeah. How did the second book do compared to the first? Um, well, my second book was a terrible one. I've written four. Um, but the, the second one actually I think is one of my best books as far as like when you read it, I think mm -hmm. it has, it's, it's, and I've heard that from a few people who've read all my books. They think it's fantastic, but it was badly titled and it was poorly positioned. And so it didn't sell very well at all. Mm -hmm. My other two books, cause they're related to book launchers and the, the one that I needed help finishing, um, it was just a lot of information. Like you said, I mean, it's, I think they're fantastic books for anybody that's writing a book. It will mm -hmm. help a lot. Um, but, and they do really, really well for growing the business. You know, they, they serve their purpose. What's the name of that book? Um, there's self-publish and succeed and self-promote and succeed. Okay. Yeah. And I give, I actually give self-promote and succeed away in audiobook by the thousands oh. because for me, especially I have the thing against audible. I do publish books on audible, but they're not very nice to authors. They set the price. So mm. you don't get to say, mm. and they pay you 25% for your efforts for a digital thing. I mean, there's no cost. I mean, there's a little bit of cost in their storage and distribution of it, but tiny. So wow. they keep a lot on that. So I thought on this latest book, I thought, well, I don't need to pay audible to sell my book. I'll just give it to people. Wow. <laughs> so I give it away, but it's great because it teaches. So when somebody comes into our company and they've read or listened to the books, they now speak our language. They understand why we're saying, okay, this is the first kind of editing. This is the second kind of editing. You need all of it. They don't, you don't have to spend hours explaining it. You've, so, ta you've taught a customer how to be a customer exactly or you've taught a client how to be a client yeah and they get more out of our service they're the, so they're happier and right. my team's happier because they're not repeating the same thing over and over and trying to argue with somebody that yes you do need this second edit here's why because right. they're already they already know it's coming wow mm -hmm. how many edits do they usually go do people usually go three through? different kinds so you work with three different editors so the first one is what you describe is what we would call a content or a developmental edit so it's like that thirty thousand foot view mm -hmm. is this book actually good does it have does it deliver on the promise right the next one is what most people think of which is the red lined you know <laughs> your your high school english teacher yeah, that tortured just you just gave you a, a yeah C. exactly yeah. so that that one's kind of traumatic for people but it's you know they're following the rules and doing sentence structure word choice grammar punctuation and then the final one is a proofread and the proofread goes through for consistency for me they add 250 commas to my book like i apparently don't use any commas hmm. and so not a comma person apparently not I, so you don't pause well i guess i don't no, yeah. just keep going <laughs> must, must be part of your like this this go 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 i don't know yeah. they uh, either that or i just never learned the comma rules which would explain the c i got in grade 10 that you know, because <laughs> I didn't use the commas. But yeah, so the, the proofreader, though, is that eagle eye, right? They're, they're, they're your last defense against mm. people reviewing your book going, eh, they, they didn't have an editor, right? Mm. Well, they had an editor. There's just four typos that somebody missed. Wow. I, I had an English teacher that, I had a teacher that actually dared to give me a C. <laughs> um, I w it was unbelievable. It was, I got progress reports, right? Because yeah. I couldn't take it, you know, I took A's home. My dad was very strict. Yeah. Um, a C would be a whipping. I'd get my butt yeah. whipped. So um, I got a progress report. I intercepted the where the and I'm like, how 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 did I get a C? So I ended up mm -hmm. staying. Miss Haley, I ended up staying at her house. And I think it was in fifth grade. I ended up staying the weekend at her house, and uh, she had cancer. She had one of her legs cut off, oh, and it was, and I love her in the sense that she would not cave on that sea and i spent all weekend doing a complete book report and getting the book report done and I, it was just like yeah it was it was just so good yeah um because it was it made me she made me work for it and uh you know she gave me a b you know i wasn't going to get to an a but <laughs> good <for> uh, her. <laughs> I, I tipped it over from a from a c plus yeah. to like a b minus yeah um, in that, and she had to deal with me, uh, over the weekend, which is for a teacher. I mean, she spent all week teaching and then yeah. on top of that, she's, she's got me there and she was so committed and I was so committed. I wasn't going to give up. She wasn't going to give up. So yeah. I guess I ended up staying at her house. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, uh, it was, yeah, it was, she had this, this, this chair that creeped up the stairs real slow. Oh, one of those mechanical like yeah. sit in them chairs. Yeah. Yeah. And I was like, and it was a different environment for me, a different smell and, it was just like kind of like trippy. Yeah. Um, I don't want to say it was traumatic because it, it's, uh, you know, I respect what she did. 
way above any of the yeah. moments that and the compassion for cancer and here she is teaching like oh my god yeah she just you know you just feel for someone like that you yeah know? well if you're a neurotic if you're a sociopath probably don't care <laughs> but um and for those sociopaths out there i'm sorry i brought up compassion i'm just you know it's one of the things i'm not trying to say you need to be compassionate you know if you don't feel compassion empathy it's all good you know it's just how god made you, <laughs> you know? there's enough sociopaths out there I think that's one of the bad things is when you try and push empathy or compassion on sociopaths, it's probably not a good thing. <laughs> I don't try. <laughs> I, I think they get pissed off. They're like, I don't feel that. Why, why, are, yeah. you, why are you making me feel? Why, yeah. why are you making me? I just try to avoid those conversations. <laughs> yeah. But how, how do you tell if somebody's a sociopath? You don't always know. It's not like they wear a sign or a no. shirt. No. Usually it's further on in the, <laughs> the relationship of some kind that you discover it. Yeah. Yeah. Where you see him kick a dog and you go, okay, yeah. <laughs> like, they just don't care. Yeah, that's, that's a dark subject. Huh? Yeah, sorry, I was sorry, say, sorry about that. Let's I'm go like, somewhere else. Let's go somewhere else. Yeah, let's get off that one. Yeah. Yeah, I was like, hey, we, could, we could edit this. <laughs> God, yeah, that's a tough one. I, I think a lot about that kind of stuff. I study a lot of, a lot of psychology. I think it's yeah. so important in communication. I think it's important in writing a book. Yep that you relate to people and mm -hmm. that people can understand what you're saying. Um, I think hooks are super important. Yep. Um, and, and that's a, I think it's tough to figure out what will really hook. Obviously the market to, marketing department got your hook wrong. Well, they didn't. Yeah. I mean the second book with, mm -hmm. with that one, I didn't have a marketing department. It was just me. It was just me. Um, but for me, the problem was I was trying to use it as a transition. So I was, if I'd written the book on how to raise money for real estate, because it was a branding book, if I'd written it on that for real estate investors, it would have sold incredibly well. Mm. But I tried to make it generic, right? It, and the title was also bad. The title was The New Brand You. And I did all these podcast interviews to promote the book. And people would be holding the book in front of them and they would call it The Brand New You. Wow. So there was something wrong with that title, which I actually spent a lot of time researching and working on the title and I had a marketing expert help me. But what I never did was tell somebody the title and then ask them shortly after if they could remember my title. Hmm. If I'd done that, I would have discovered that for whatever reason, everybody's brain wanted to call it the brand new you, not the new brand you. Wow. So it was weird. So yeah, it had a couple problems, but the, the hook of it was basically how to sell, like, you know, how to, how to use your brand to sell, which is what I did when I raised capital. You know, the book was fundamental to that. But then people, you know, got, saw my YouTube channel. They got to know me as a person mm -hmm. and I never had to ask them for money. People offered it to me. And so wow. that's really what the principle of the book was. But I didn't want, you know, I knew we were kind of starting to leave our real estate coaching behind. So I didn't position it for real estate investors. I positioned it more generically. It's a bit of a mistake. Again, it goes back to that. If you're not famous, you need to know who your audience is and, and that hook for that audience. And so I had a generic audience, which didn't, it didn't fly. Wow. Yeah. But wow. I'll rewrite that book for authors. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Especially, I mean, there's so many people that want to get that story out. And now it's more doable than ever before. Mm -hmm. Like it, it, before Amazon, you know, it, it was next to it was super costly and yep. almost next to impossible. Yeah. The, the gates were there and it was guarded yep. and um, the big publishers made all the money. Yeah. Um, and they guarded those gates and they controlled the distribution. Yep. And now I'm even more excited than ever because you can sell direct, right? And the tools to sell direct and not have to store a thousand books in your garage mm -hmm. uh, because most people don't have, you know, as much space. <laughs> 12,000 12, square feet. Yeah, yeah. yeah most got... people don't have that kind of space. It's cramped and... here. Me and my wife, it's very cramped. <laughs> You've you got know? room for a couple books, but you yeah, know, you, yeah. even you probably don't want to store a thousand books in your house, or at least your wife probably wouldn't I, want I, to. Yeah, that's true. That's true. That's true. <laughs> um, but no, she'll say sell them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, well, yeah. go sell them. And that's the goal. But now there's so many tools out there where you can distribute those books direct to a reader. So if you know anything about marketing, running ads, you can now sell those books and get their contact information. And Amazon's not in the middle because Amazon never tells you who buys the book. Yeah. You know, even Ingram, which is one of the big catalogs, they won't even tell you what chain, you know, because it'll sell through the bookstores. They won't give you any of that data. Wow. So you know nothing. You'll know it's sold in Texas or it's sold in Ohio, but you won't know anything else. I get my royalty reports from uh, from Ingram and it's like 
yeah, it's just like this unit sold this over the quarter, this in the past year, and mm -hmm. you know the mystery returns. Yeah, the mystery. Yeah, you have no. <laughs> yeah, that's another one. I'm mm -hmm. like, hmm, that's yeah. weird. Yeah, we had one client who had 112 returns. And, you know, they sold a couple thousand books, but still 112 returns was quite a bit. That's quite a bit. And we couldn't get any information as to why. All we could assume was that a bookstore chain ordered it by accident, mm. like ordered too many by accident or ordered some, you know, ordered a couple cases by accident and then returned it. But mm. you don't get any information on any of that. So I love selling direct and there's, you know, only in the last 12 months has it become easier to do that so that you don't have to be the warehouse and distribution of doing it. And you can get the contact information and you can sell and you can create the experience that you want to create for your reader. So I'm, I'm like, I was excited before, but now I'm even more excited. So, uh, um, so what platform is being sold on then if it's not through um, Amazon or Ingram? Yeah, your website. Oh, your website. Yeah, okay. so you build your own website. and then <laughs> Which I brought up VSL today. That's <laughs> funny, right? Yeah, so you could use a VSL uh, right? to sell yeah. a book. I actually have one that sells um, my, my book, Self Publish and Succeed. I do. I guess have a we VSL. should tell people what that is. <laughs> yeah, a VSL. video sales letter. Yeah. yeah. Somebody will think it's a bag. Yeah. YSL. Oh, yes, right? Yes, it's not a bag. I actually went to that factory in, <laughs> that, that, in Paris. Um, little, yeah. little side note. Yeah. Um, yeah, and, and the VSL, by the way, is just a voice over video top of sales slides. Letter. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's not a person and talking um, typically but um, and now I don't even know where we oh yeah so you have your website and then there's uh, the, the channel that I really like right now they're called book fault and mm -hmm. they'll sell, they'll print it print on demand and they'll ship the book to your reader straight from your website so you just connect it we use uh, Shopify and a Zapier a little zap code and it goes into my CRM so now I know who they are so I can send them into my my funnel where they get to know me they get to know book launchers and and book funnel is sending or book vault sorry is sending them the book. Well, they uh, like I have. So I'm the only one that has the hardback. Yeah. Um, this the soft cover Amazon and Ingram that they, they do all those. Um, I'm the only one with, with hard copies. Mm -hmm. But when people order off my website, I actually have to ship it. Yeah, it's a pain in the butt. It's a pain. I've got to mm -hmm. stop what I'm doing. I got to put a label on it, throw it in in packaging, yep. and I have to like go to the post office, which is the post office is literally a block away. Yeah. So. You know, it's not the end of the world, but still, I think about that might be 30 minutes of my day for one and what, what, what I make per hour. That doesn't even make sense. No. That's not. Well, they, so does Book Vault hold your books? They, they print them when they get sold. What happens if you have a physical copy? I guess I'll just have them for, for speaking. It is physical. Mm. This is physical. So, I mean, there's other ways to do it with ebooks and, and uh, audiobooks. Like I can sell my audiobook direct. I'm, I'm giving it away, but the same, the same system I use to give it away for free, mm -hmm. I can sell it. I can just hook up a Shopify storefront and then connect it in there to then deliver the audiobook for free too. So wow. all of that exists. And a lot of these tools weren't there a year or two years ago. Oh, wow. So now you can have so much more control over that. And I still sell them on Amazon and you know they're available in the library. So I still do all of that. Mm -hmm. But if I can get a, a direct sale, I'd rather do that. It is so much easier. Mm -hmm. It is so much easier. And I'm not making, I'm making almost the same no matter where I sell it because book, book vault is a little bit more expensive after the, like it's about $10 per book. If I sell it for 18, actually I'm making $8 on it, which is more than Amazon pays me. For sure. So, you know, it, it works out pretty well to sell direct, but then I have ad costs. So, yeah, you know. And you're probably for the, for the actual book, if you were to print it, it might be five or six bucks. Exactly. Print so, it, then media mail it, $3. Yeah, so. storage. And yeah. a lot of people don't think about all those other factors. Yeah. Um, now, have you had authors that were able to get speaking gigs after mm. they published? How did that work? Yeah. So, I mean, part of what we do is marketing. So we okay. pitch you for podcasts, live appearances. We, you know, we do bookstore and library outreach. We run Amazon ads, book award submissions. So we do all of that. Mm -hmm. um, what, what doesn't happen is instantaneous. Like some people think my book's out, I, I should be getting paid to speak. Right. There's a journey. You know, a lot of them start with being a panelist on, if they've never spoken before, they're mm -hmm. probably going to be a panelist. Or if they have given talks before, but they don't have a speaker's reel, they're mm -hmm. probably going to give some free talks and get some content and then go from there. But, you know, some of our authors are already doing some speaking and then the book just escalates that and it, you know, it can really catapult what they're doing. One of our, one of our authors, he uh, is like a paid MC. So he flies all over the country, actually all over the world, doing MC for conferences. But he said he wanted to be, he wanted to give more of the talks himself. 
So he wrote his book. So now he's starting to do the talks as well as still does his MC work. So, because wow. it, it started to show them when he did his MC work, he'd give them a copy of his book and they go, hey, next year, like you should talk about this on our stage. So no it, was, it was a great way for him to start to build that part of what he was doing. So it, you walk through that so fast for, <laughs> for people. Can we break that down? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So step one is... Book. Book. <laughs> Book. Okay. Step two. <laughs> so it, the path, we'll assume they haven't spoken before, okay. right? Because okay. that's where the path is different. Right. If you've spoken before, you probably have some assets in place where you can start to go from there. But if you haven't spoken before, step one is to speak, right? Even if you're not paid for it. So do a panel, do a small talk. Like one of our authors, he's uh, he'd never given talks before. And He'd never given talks before, and he did. You okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. No. So, no worries. It's okay. I was just looking. Yeah. I was like, <laughs> we, "We doing okay over there?" Yeah. Um, he'd never given talks before, and now he's giving talks to thirty to hundred people. Mm -hmm. The goal for those is to record them, get recordings, so that after you've done a few of these, you can build a speaker reel. Because if you're an unknown name in the speaking industry, people either need to be referred, like, "Hey, I saw so and so talk, and it's fantastic," right. or they need to see your speaker reel and want your topic. But if you don't have a speaker reel, they're not going to go with you. They're going to go with somebody that's been referred or somebody that they can see how they talk. Right. So that's kind of the stages of it. That usually takes people about six months, you know, sometimes a year even, depending on your industry. And, you know, if you can get those first little talks and do those for free. Some people will get paid early on, but it's not common. You know, it's more common that you're going to do free talks and then lead up to now you're going to get paid to speak. It seems like a, a lot of the people that I've talked to that were trying to get speaking gigs were being charged to actually speak. Well, that's another thing. Same with podcasts. We run into that too, is yeah. people are, they're like, I've got the audience. You pay me to get in front of my audience. Right. But, you know, that's more prevalent in the real estate industry. The real estate stages, they charge you in a lot of cases to be on the stage or their podcasts. But there's still, like, if you go the corporate route, uh, you know, those, the, those companies are still paying. Right. Oh, okay. You know, if you've got a bunch of HR professionals in a room, mm -hmm. that HR association, they'll pay you to be on stage. So oh. there's a lot of paid speaking gigs in certain industries. We are finding that like pay to play kind of thing. But it's it's if you want to sell from the stage, that's a different conversation. But if you're giving a high value talk, people will pay you for it. Wow. That's interesting. I hadn't thought about, um, you know, probably my my big place would be um, at Linder's. Um, conventions and stuff like that talking about how to talk and relate to people to and, be able to sell them loans and that should be a paid a paid you not you paying to be on that stage but being paid to be there yeah i'm spent 15 years trying to help people get get access to capital yeah and um bankers still don't get it hmm. they don't they don't know how to comfortably walk people through and make them feel comfortable or there's just no commitment on the lender side to get somebody like a loan's approved. It'll go through, but the person's just not that interested in getting the deal done because it's work. It's a yeah. process. You know, I do. it's a process to get that, that done. I've got two SBA deals that are one for four, one for two, um, that I'm working on right now that, you know, it's, it's like they're done deals. They make sense. They cash flow. They'll fit in the box. I just need the underwriter and, and everybody to fit it in the box. It works already. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, the buyers and sellers think I'm magical, you know, and it's like, no, it's just, I'm an underwriter. I understand the whole process. I understand yeah. everybody's job. Um, but yeah, that's, I hadn't thought about like, those are the people that I sh should be getting in front of. And I'm number one in the space. Hmm. There's nobody like even close. Yeah. Like for 15 years, I've owned that domain. So it's kind of funny. I've never even, you know, maybe I should write a book on, you know, borrow your way to riches, <laughs> you know, which is true. I mean, yeah. leverage is, is, you know, give me the right size lever and I can, I can lift the world. Yeah. You know, it's like, and money is that way, you know, especially when you're in a positive uh, leverage situation yeah. where you're getting a higher amount of return. Like if you're getting a 6% return and your leverage is 3% like it was for like a decade, yeah. like people that didn't buy real estate during that time, like what were you thinking? You had yeah. positive leverage. And if you got 25 year money, like with the SBA, yeah, like what are you, do what are you doing? Yeah. Like you had the chance to make generational wealth. Yeah. And, you know, 
And they're like, oh, they like 3% was going to be guaranteed for life. No, yeah. that's guaranteed when we have no inflation. And, you know, and the, the Fed's trying to get us to inflate. Yeah. Then you'll get 0%. We don't need that help now. <laughs> no. Now we're like, now we have to tame it. But I've, I, you know, I've seen 18% interest rates. Yeah. I've seen 21% interest rates in my day. Yeah. Right? When Carter was in office, I remember waiting in line, um, you know, at the gas station and uh, could only get gas on certain days. Yeah. Can you imagine? Like, no. I don't think people can imagine that. No, like, I can't imagine that. that we, can, we can get, based on our license plate, we can get gas on Tuesday, Thursday. So <laughs> <laughs> if, if you, you know, wow. uh, you know, so yeah, it was crazy. That, yeah, that's you, wild. Yeah. But yeah, my first property, I think our interest rate was 7.9. And, you know, we thought that was horrible. And my dad just kept saying, 18 percent that's what my first you know my first property i paid 18 percent on my first property that's what my dad kept saying i would love i love 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 to see 18 percent interest rates <laughs> i would love to see it i would love to see it because everybody would be like getting out of there for, for a steal <laughs> well think about the cap rates that would be out there yeah the cap the cap rate would they'd be like okay it's an 18 percent cap rate <laughs> I make 18% of my money and, yeah. you know, I'm paying 18%. And how, how long can it stay at 18%? Yeah. It'd be like, I, I love it when rates are ridiculously high because mm -hmm. the return becomes ridiculously high. Yeah. And then whatever cash I have sitting around makes money. Yeah. You know, there's just more money to be made when there are higher interest rates, yeah. you know, um, all the way around. Yeah. So you just have to know how to navigate it. You have to beat but you have to beat 18%, which for years we haven't been able to beat 5%. Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. Anyway, I keep saying, wait, anyway, I would keep going to finance. I'm sorry. <laughs> you're just touching buttons. <laughs> so let's get back to the speaker journey because I'm sure lots of people would love to speak on stage, mm -hmm. probably write a book to speak, yep. um, which is why I wanted to kind of tap into that yep. um, more. So how did they become a panelist? So, I mean, it, there's Because that's a start. You book, yeah. we got the book. Uh, we've called you. Yep. You've helped us get there. Yep. Right. With your three uh, editing people, one yep. of them is yep. going to piss you off. One that's going <laughs> to offer you hope, and a guy, that, the person that's going to get you across the finish line. Okay. So we yes. got that, right? Yes. We got those. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. we got a through line. You know what it was like to turn fifty, yep. doing a world champion Ironman in October. So you know I'm right in the heart of my midlife crisis. I've lost my butt. <laughs> I just confirmed that. A couple days ago with the wife. Too much running. She videotaped me naked. And I'm like, oh, where did my butt go? I used to have the biggest butt. I used to have a huge butt. Oh, dear. Like, I played soccer. It was huge. I would get teased in school for having a big butt, yeah. you know? And I was proud of that butt. I don't know where... You get 50 and it just goes away. So I started looking it up. And they're like, yeah, you lose your butt. when yep. And then your back goes. My back went. No. Yeah, I was two weeks in bed with my back. You lose your butt, you lose your back. So I've got to get my butt back. <laughs> you know? How did we get here? Well, yeah, but without the implants. Yeah, so, so, okay. All right, so let's get our butts back in the game here. All right, so, yeah. But that would be the through line, I think, for like turning 50, right? Get your You've butt got back. Get my butt back. Um, the world, you know, all the stuff that happens to a 50-year-old. Oh, my yep. God, who knew? Like now I kind of understand yeah. what my dad was talking about back in the day. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So plus you can relate to people like that are 80 and start to feel pains and you're like, they, what the they hell? They creak when they start to stand up. Yeah. yeah. You're like, oh, my knee just popped. Yeah. yeah. All kinds of stuff. Or you're more cautious. Yeah. So I could see that in a book being like a through line. Yep. Yeah. Right. So then I got my peeps to put it together. What 50 was like or what 50 is like, yeah. so, you know, the halfway point, whatever it may be. And then grammatically we put it together we got all this stuff and then i want to speak on a panel that has to do with like say maybe anti-aging right i'm just i'm creating a whole yeah you see where i'm going here yep okay so we got this we got the book people can relate oh my god i've experienced all this stuff i lost my butt too yeah right and then we, who do i call for that panel so i would start looking we usually start with who do you already know so we actually had a client kind of have a book like this not i lost my butt but you know <laughs> fitness fitness is in, that a hooky title you know, i mean it could be <laughs> i lost my butt right i mean people i think we want to make sure the subtitle sells them on how they're going to get their butt back <laughs> 
or you know what the upside of having no butt is, uh, yeah. you know, something get like that. Get your butt back in the game. Exactly. But so where we started was okay, where's your association? So, you know, Iron Man, good example. Okay. Are there groups like of Iron Man people uh, that are meeting that you might be able to speak at some sort of an Iron Man conference or is there some sort of a brand that you love that you could go and speak at that is talking about this, right? Can you be some sort of a I don't want to call it a brand um, influencer, but they're often looking for, they have conferences. I've, I've looked up the audience size of the Iron Man audience. Not a big uh, audience. Not a big audience, but. 140 yeah. miles, you know, in 12 it's, it's to 16 hours of your and day. Yet, I know a lot of people who've done Iron Man, so. Maybe yeah, I, but you I, just probably know a lot yeah. of A personalities. I, You're pretty probably intense. True. That's probably true. pretty intense, Julie. Yeah, you yes. got the good smile, but I, I can see <laughs> your intensity is ridiculous. You, you, it can you're, be. You're tenacious. It can be. Just don't yeah. tell me I can't do something. I, I'm not going to tell you you can't do something. Because then i got to go do it. I'll yeah, just have yeah. to be like, sorry, i got to go now. <laughs> okay. Well, you, you can't do longer than an hour and a 15-minute uh, podcast. Actually, that's accurate. <laughs> oh, oh, but I just told you you can't. <laughs> well, sometimes it's true. <laughs> sometimes I have other limitations. You can tell I'm real but or I'm totally butt hurt on the fact that she she only has that much time for me so anyway you're gonna have to come back yeah i can do that it's not okay. that far it right. wasn't it wasn't that bad it's, oh. it's like a different country coming here but it's not that bad <laughs> you're so right only people in vegas would understand the summerland that Henderson is a summerland thing. Henderson that is, that is a, you know people in california go what you it got, only took you 30 minutes it, it, to get there? It took you 30 minutes? And you're like complaining? That's I like know. five miles for us. I know. You know? <laughs> I know. When I first moved here, I thought it was a dream. I was like, really? 30 so minutes? Me too. I grew up in the Bay Area. So it was like, yeah, that's it? Yeah. All right. Yeah, so, is. okay. Iron Man, small group. Yeah. But I'm thinking, I'm thinking health. Yep. Right? I'm currently on Majorno. Yep. Do you know what Majorno yep. is? Um, I just... You know, like I have to lose 25 pounds and I'm desperate and I try to diet and nothing like yep. nothing dropped off my at 50, like nothing drops like yeah. it's stuck like glue, you know, and I have I realized I hadn't seen my abs since I was 18. Hmm. I didn't think about that till the other day and it yeah. wasn't a good thought. But so here here we are. Maybe I'm health, which is a yeah. bigger audience. Everyone can relate to health and yeah. weight loss. Right. So and then on top of that, weight loss while being like I hadn't I didn't eat in 24 hours. The mm -hmm. only thing I ate was a small steak yep. and um, I biked 30 miles mm -hmm. and ran six yesterday. Yeah. How are you going to get your butt back if you're not eating? I, have, I don't know. Yeah. That's a different conversation. But so, so yes, health is bigger, but I would start smaller because you're not a known name at this point. Right? I'm not a Goggins. Like yeah. Goggins is ridiculous right? in this space. He's and like he the charges, God of that space. And he space. charges accordingly. So, yeah. um, so you're not a known space so, mm -hmm. or a known name. So we want to start with those local things. So maybe okay. you're part of some sort of an association or a group. That's why I was kind of going down the Iron Man club. Like maybe you're part yeah, of a club. Yeah, that's true. Start, you, start, start a home. home exactly. Home base with the... Because all you need is, is that start, right? You need to yeah. say, I've spoken in front of. I need video footage of you speaking. So start. You don't have to go big to begin with. You can start yeah. local. Start with the small groups. When I started speaking in the real estate space, my first two talks were for, at meetup groups. Hmm. They were just small little meetup groups. Now, I kind of wish I'd had a few more of those because then my next talk was in front of 650 people you know, getting mic'd up. So I wow. made a big jump quickly. Um, which I don't recommend because that was a big, you know, 13 people in my first audience, 25, and then 650. But most people, there's meetup groups, there's clubs, associations. If you're near your alumni, like your university, college, whatever you went to, that was something some of our authors have done too. They have, they bring in their alum and they have different talks. So that's some of it. We also I've never seen anybody give a talk at a meetup group. No. No. Yeah. I mean, I've given tons of them. And some of, I, some of my clients have done it too. Depends on the meetup, depends on the city. But so, do you like everyone meets up and then you get on stage and you just start talking? So you know meetup.com, right? That's what I'm talking about, yeah, the yeah. website. Yeah. yeah. So they have... And usually, it's not a dating app. It's, no. It's like for meeting. Exactly. Yeah. And so some of them have monthly meetings. They kind of treat it like a club and they have monthly meetings and they usually have some sort of a speaker come in and create content deliver something. There's got to be some reason to meet up for most of them. Okay. So the real estate ones was where I did a lot of talks and some of them were big. Like some of them were 250 people in this room that were all, they just used meetup to organize their club and they wow. charged a fee and they, they bought books. I even sold, I sold a lot of books to meetup groups too, because they would pay, they'd say the first 50 people to register gets a signed book from the speaker. And do you so, do meetups now? I don't know. What happened? I you fell off the bandwagon? 
Yeah, I don't, you know, now that I say that, maybe I should look. I don't know actually I'm, I'm what like, meetup I would go to. I'm, I'm like, I don't know why I'm not. Yeah. Like, this, that's crazy. Um, like, so, I could do meetups across the country too, maybe with the audience. Yeah. That would love to just like hang out for. And meet. there's a lot of entrepreneur meetup groups too, right? Wow. There are, you know, people that would be in the business or looking for buying business. I mean, buying business is a big topic these days. There's, there's lots of different groups popping up everywhere yeah, on that. It's so funny. Very few, like the whole process really. I mean, I'm a business broker. So yeah. been for over a decade and started companies, sold them, helped people sell. I've had five yeah. exits myself. The people that are teaching people how to buy businesses are like, it's wild. It's like copy and paste from a book. Yeah. You know, not real hardcore experience. But, you know, what's crazy about it is if you if you fake something long enough, it becomes reality. Yeah. That's what's mind boggling to me. Yeah. If you if you lie long enough, your lie will become true. My brother used to say that all the time when my mom would say, hey, you're lying. Well, I've, I, I believe it's true, so it must be true. Yeah. <laughs> he would say, if you tell the lie long enough, it becomes your truth. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's interesting. I mean, even even Donald Trump talks about how like he was always positive, right? With yep. the, the, his person that he would like the power of positivity or positive thinking. Yeah. And he just always states things in the positive. Um, probably really easy to listen to when you're going to like one of the events about how amazing it's going to be and how wonderful yeah. it's going to be. Probably doesn't sound as appealing to a lot of people in America when he's talking about America that way. But yeah, because it doesn't seem real. Like that doesn't translate things or we got some stuff going on here that, yeah. So it's pretty crazy. I'm not excited about either. Like I, I don't very much like politicians either side. So, you know, I, I believe in America. I like America, but, uh, and what it, st- what it stands for. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty crazy. So we, we've got the meetup, which is a, I think wonderful. I think you should do them again. I'd love to go to one of your meetups. Yeah. Yeah. And then, so you do a meetup because that's free, right? Mm-hmm. Or maybe thirty dollars a month. Yeah, like I said, I actually got paid to to speak at some of the bigger meetups, but a lot of them uh-huh. are local. They're small, so they won't necessarily pay you. Mm-hmm. Um, but if they're charging a fee and they're making money off the people coming in, you know, and you're the hook to get you there, exactly. So that's wow. why you know I did get paid for some of those, but. Um, but yeah, so meetup is one, you know, some of the groups and associations, you know, depending on what your book topic is, if we're sticking with the health, mm-hmm. you got to look around and see what's going on. But you can also go to your chamber of commerce. They have a list of all the events that are happening for pretty much the next year. So you, it's painful, especially Vegas, <laughs> to go through the chamber of commerce and see what events are coming up. But you can see, and a lot of them will have the ability to submit for a panelist. So oh. they're, because they're all looking for panelists. So you can, you know, the keynote talk is harder and they usually secure that before they start promoting that they need a speaker, but you can go on. And then, the, you know, so they have like speaker submission mm-hmm. and then it will say, you know, do you want to be a panel? And the other, the other kind of trick here is you can build your own panel and sometimes they'll be very grateful that you did that oh. because otherwise they're putting together a panel and trying to make sure there's synergy and that it's going to be a good conversation wow. and, and all of those things. So a lot of them uh, will say, are you submitting a panel? And then you can, you know, submit yourself as one of the panelists or a moderator or any of those things. So, and you could do that through the Chamber of Commerce website. You'll find the site for the event through the Chamber of Commerce. So and then you, you can go to. And be then a- you go to their site, and you go to the bottom, and it usually says, you know, speaker applications or speaker apps, things like that, or wow. speaker submission, you know, those kind of things, and go that way. I've tried using because um, my team pitches everybody uh, for this, but I always try to find a hack or <laughs> like, is there an easier way to do this? Right. Google alerts can work. Like if you do a Google alert for your city and speaker submission, that it doesn't work perfectly, but you might get notified of something that way too. Wow. Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. It, you can tell you're in the, you're in the thick of this or they could just call you and you could do it. Not me, but someone on my team would. <laughs> well, they call, you know, yes, get a absolutely. hold of your company and somebody on your yeah, team will, yeah, will process absolutely. that. Absolutely. Have you thought about um, segmenting off different types of services or do you already do it? Like say somebody's already got a book but wants you to work on their marketing. speaking and panel type stuff. Yeah, we do We do the marketing for, we still consider ourselves book marketers, mm-hmm. but it's something that I have been working on is kind of what if somebody wants just straight publicity. They mm-hmm. don't really care about you know, all the other book marketing stuff that we do around book awards and bookstore outreach and all that stuff. And then speaking, you know, that's definitely a piece. Right now we just partner with some companies that do a good job of putting people on stages and getting speaker reels and things like that. But I can see how bringing it all under one roof Mm -hmm. would be so much more efficient and effective and probably higher margin for us overall, because, you know, 
we're high touch service, so the margin's not always that pretty. Yeah, I um, own a podcast, commercial podcast studio here in town. Have you seen it? No, you mentioned it, though, last time I saw you. Yeah, so I'm thinking if you're wanting to get people on podcasts, yeah, um, we have, you know, everybody's come. I mean, we have a ton of people, yeah. video wall, the whole bit, oh, cool. you know, in the yeah. studio. Um, and yeah, so it's weird because people try hard to yeah. access. And these podcasts, they, they need people. Always. Um, and they get hit constantly with people and it's, it's weird cause they turn everybody away. But if I make a phone call to them, it's, oh, okay. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's really weird. Yeah. I find po- that it's re- the whole onboarding onto getting onto a podcast is really strange. Yeah, it can be. And I think some of it's because there's so many crappy people, like not people, but like AI tools and other systems that people are using to just do mass outreach. Yeah. And so everybody gets these generic pitches yeah. and it's boring and it's not interesting. And half the time it's not even applicable or it's got somebody the wrong name or the wrong podcast title in it. So, I mean, for us, we build relationships, which kind of like you said, you pick up the phone. And it's like, oh, yeah, someone. So, yeah, sure. Yeah. Come on. on. Um, but the other side of it, too, is just doing that research, the extra effort to actually research the podcast, find out why this person would be a good fit for that podcast and then actually do a tailored pitch and then yeah. follow up. It works so much better, but it's way more work. Yeah, it is more work. I think that's the great thing about all these AI tools is it'll make being human important again. Mm-hmm. It, it, with mm-hmm. books, you know, kind of going back to that is the AI books, they don't have that human element that like, what was it like to be in the hole? Was it 18 million? You know, the second time. 12. 12, 12, 12 sorry. I knew there was so an eight in there. <laughs> not 18 million. God, that would have been really bad. 12, it was only 12.8. 12. 12. 12. 12. 12. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, but the AI can't, ex- can't share what can't that was like. can experience that. They don't, you know, they don't know what it was like. So, so the AI is like, has no, like, it, it can't train feelings into it. Like... Not Uh, effective, at least not effectively in in a way that communicates in writing. So, you know, to me, that's going to make the people who put that grit and those experiences in their book and don't just sell all the highlights, that's going to make that book so much more powerful and relatable and a better read. So it will stand above all the AI stuff that's getting created. Not to mention AI is like, um, it doesn't have all your stories. No. You know, it's not going to know all your stories. And even if you tell it, it's still going to turn it into an odyssey, a journey, or a transformation. Yeah. <laughs> Those are like, I get books all the time and I, I, I don't even have to, they don't even have to tell me they wrote it with AI because the first sentence says, you know, you're about to embark on some journey of transformation. I'll just be like, uh, did AI write this? Well, yeah, I used, I used chat GPT. I'm like, yeah, can't tell at all. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Um, and do you think that'll, that'll pass? For, it'll change. I think it'll improve. I mean, already what we're seeing the today. Worst, yeah, I always tell people, they ask me, what do you think of AI? I said, AI is the worst it's ever going to be right now. Exactly. And then ask me the same question tomorrow. I'll say, say the same thing. Yeah. Um, Anna has a PhD in artificial intelligence. Yeah. And she's got uh, 450 employees that, that she manages over at Google. Yeah. Um, and then she's got her master's in machine learning. And she, so we talk about AI every day. Yeah. Is, is, and there's a new conversation and new things that they didn't because most people have no idea how AI actually comes together. Yep. Do you know how it comes together? So that it's funny you say that because I never really thought about it. And then my one of my friends has built this whole company around um, dramatically squishing the processing mm-hmm. for it mm-hmm. because there's not enough capacity mm-hmm. to run all the AI. So he's he's now started this company where they compress it. So I but I was like, I don't get it. So he had to draw me diagrams mm-hmm. to explain how to how this whole thing works. But until then, no, I never really thought about how much processing capacity is required for this. Yeah, it's is quite un- unbelievable. But people actually think um like I I look at the people that have some of the major like anthropic and the the major foundation level um, as the luckiest people out there yeah. because once you've built out, once you have the system in place, it grows. Mm-hmm. So its capabilities are machine learned. Yeah. They, they come out of that process. So what they're actually creating, they're not coding. They don't even know how it's coding itself, no. right? They're just like, they give birth to this thing, give it some guidelines and then watch what happens. Yeah. It's like, they're just mad scientists is all they are. Wondering what's going <laughs> to come out of it. Yeah. And, um, 
but th there's no real science science going on. So it's like, and then they got hundreds of millions of dollars to play with. I'm like, oh, you guys are so lucky because it's not like you have to be a, a, a code or anything. You just grow these different models and they grow. And then when it makes a bunch of mistakes, you can that model and you regrow it and you make some tweaks to it. And then it turns into something crazy. And then you go, okay, let's put that over there and let's grow another model. Yeah. You know, you take data into the model and, you know, it's like, it's just, it, I look at that and I go, man, these guys are the luckiest. Cause I mean, Mark Zuckerberg had to code everything. Yeah. And he had to get coders and like, you don't need coding anymore. No. They'll hire, uh, you know, labelers. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden the machine will start labeling and then they'll get rid of the labelers. And then they have coders and now they're getting rid of coders because the, it's coding. Yeah. And then, it'll actually improve its own code. So you can tell it, like, yeah. make that code better, yeah. more efficient. So it does. Yeah. It's like... That's the, that's the part that scares everybody. Yeah, and I think we're about two years away. Um, maybe a year. The thing is, it's you can't really predict this because I, I wrote about it in my book, actually, yeah. Artificial Intelligence. Um, and I wrote that in 2016 yeah. about how, how it will go like this and then straight up. Yeah. Right? Um, and that's where we're at, that, that straight up yep. phase. And that's where things can become a thousand times better, 10,000 times better, a million, a billion yeah. times better. And, and then you're, then you're full AGI <laughs> or ASI, which a lot of people are not talking about, which would be artificial super intelligence yeah. where we're no longer the, the apex creature. The robots on the, are. Yeah. Robots are. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it, it's, it's pretty wild. It's almost happening so fast that you can't almost write a book about it. Well, that is the challenge, right? We've, we've worked with some people writing books on AI and what we've had to, to do so that it's not a book that's completely you know, out of date before it even goes to print is to try to talk about some of the underlying pieces, mm -hmm. right? So if it's, if it's AI for business, we're not talking about a specific tool doing a specific thing with a specific prompt. We're talking about the business strategy behind how to employ AI yeah. in your company and make the decisions of when do you when it, when do you need a person to run the AI versus the person doing the job, yeah. and how does that look? So that's how we've kind of approached it, but it's still it's unavoidable. I think that when you talk about that, that there's elements of your book that still will be out of date. Yeah. But if you can kind of go to that evergreen, more like go to the strategy that versus the tactics, that can help with that. But it's tricky. Yeah, I called it, and it's relevant, and it's not outdated, which, there you is, go. which is cool. Um, I also talked about, uh, which I'm waiting on, is um, the communication system between the, the um, lymphatic system and actually computer talking chemically oh, through us. Yeah, which like is, the chip, the chips. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and a lot, of that, um, a lot of that process, which is just mind-boggling. I talk yeah. about a lot of the chemistry in my book as well. Yeah. Neopeptides, how they transition through the body, how the thymus in your brain and how it makes chemical cocktails yeah. that tell your cells like what's going on. Hmm. So your every cell in your body knows like kind of what you're thinking. So it can respond appropriately. Which is why the chip can work because you know, your body will respond to that. The the one that I saw, the video I saw was somebody with a chip who who's paralyzed from the neck down and they the chip was able to communicate to the the robotic arms and things and those things were now moving based on the thoughts yeah which was it was a cool application when you see that it's like oh that's really cool but then you think about the rest of us <laughs> no and you're you're like um i don't know if you know do you know who joe uh, dispenza is yeah uh, so mm -hmm. joe's done i think eighteen thousand brain maps yeah so and i know people that are brain mapping as well and they're apple you know so the more we have that chemical you've got like an electromagnet type thing happening there because you have electrical impulses yeah right and then you have this chemistry going on at the same time yeah. that creates creates like a magnetic so our ability to interface with the mind is getting better and better and better yeah um and you know they can really see like you do something and then like meditate and see what that's like. Yep. Um, or somebody plays basketball in their mind, they see how it transitions. It's like the yep. same, same exact activated mind happens in both places. Yep. And the person who thought about playing basketball did better when they actually played basketball than the person who actually physically yep. did it. 
which so, people always talked about how visualization was going to help you, but now they actually have the scientific scientific proof to show. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, and that's in my book too, about how we create neural pathways. So when you're thinking a process through, mm -hmm. you have a neural network and, and they, they're all over the place, right? This yeah. neural net. But when they fire together, um, they become sort of sticky. The yeah. more they fire together, the more they stay together. Like you writing a book, like, you're wired. Yeah. You're wired for getting it out the door. Somebody who doesn't have those those networks established has to conceptually try and get that. Yeah. You already have it ingrained. But the, those neurosynapses that fire together stay together. So if you think something through and you build a neural network that's firing together, yeah. it's different than the physical activity because you're, you're pushing those neural networks mm. into a actual... Like, you ever have a thought, and then you have the next thought, and the next thought, yeah. and the next thought? Those are neural pathways. Yeah. As soon as you don't have those thoughts anymore, that those neurons that fired together, once they're not firing together anymore, and this could be four days after you learn something, yep. they actually move apart. That's why you have to reinforce what you learn, yep. is because those neural pathways, they start to move. It's like totally unbelievable. The The brain science is crazy. Anyway, we didn't go that, that yeah. So I, I'm just lost in talking to you. Oh, can you come back? I can I, come okay. back. We'll I can do, come back. The, I'd love there to. will be a part B or part two yeah. of this uh, epic journey. Followed by a pickleball match. Yeah. We have like some of the best pickleball places here. Did you know that? You, you told me that last time. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. I so don't we forget do pickleball. That. I don't have to reinforce anything pickleball. Now, it just stays. just stays there. <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for having me. Thank you for sharing with the audience here um, some of your stuff. How do they reach you? Um, Booklaunchers.com, best place to go. Okay. Um, or the YouTube, booklaunchers.tv. Which is incredible. I've seen a lot of your videos. Well, yeah. thank you so much for coming on. Thank you Appreciate for having you. me. It was my pleasure. Yeah.